Please make your way to your seats and get your copy of God's Word. We're going to turn to, we started about three weeks at the beginning of the Bible, see if you can find this book. We're turning to the book of Revelation. Not Revelations, Revelation, Revelation chapter 12. That's right, one Revelation. Revelation chapter 12, and we are concluding our series that we began about three weeks ago, examining the war between the serpent and the woman, between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. And in this season of Advent, in which we kind of look forward to uh, Christmas time, reminding of uh, what it was to look forward to Christ's first coming, we're also eagerly anticipating his final, his second coming to judge the wicked and to grant eternal life to his people. And his, but his first coming was of great hope and brought great hope to the world. And my goal here in the last few weeks has been to help us to reflect on that hope, beginning with why we need the hope and rejoicing in that hope that God has given us through Jesus Christ. So three weeks ago, we started in Genesis, and we, ob we observed the conflict with our adversary. As I said with uh, Mark, we put the, the serpent, we put the devil back into Christmas, and uh, you know, there's uh, that call to put Jesus in Christmas. But what I wanted you to do, observe the enemy, the dragon, the father of lies. You know, the, the, the devil, all of his deceptions, that is about himself, about God's word, about God's inherent goodness and our nature, they're all aimed to exalt us, to ensnare us in our pride, and then lead us to sin, which results in misery, oppression, tyranny, death, hell, destruction. So the devil, a proud liar, a murderer, a thief, in the garden led man astray. And then Adam and Eve... They succumbed to his ego-inflating falsehoods. They believed the lie. They ate the fruit. And then even afterwards, they attempted to cover themselves with their own good deeds. They, they were the first works righteous people immediately after their sin. But despite Adam believing all the lies about God's goodness, God in his mercy and grace showed that he was good. And so when he approached Adam and Eve... So to give them judgment, the first thing that we saw in his judgment, in the midst of his judgment, was his judgment of the serpent. That is, he condemned it to crawl on its belly, to eat in its dust. And in the middle of that, he gave this wonderful promise. That is, it was a threat to the serpent, but a beacon of hope for us. That is, there would be a conflict between the serpent and the woman, the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman, the serpent. And though that serpent would bruise the hill, its head would be inevitably ground into the dust by that very same hill. That is, the serpent would be defeated. So that was three weeks ago. Last week, we delved a little bit deeper into the history of some of that war between the serpent and between God's people. And God's people, believing the promises of God, still were assaulted greatly by the serpent. And they, and they often gave themselves in their pride to idolatry and wickedness. And they succumbed to the devil's temptations. And as we looked at last week in Micah 5, even as God disciplined his people, in the midst of judgment again, he gave a promise. In Micah 5, that promise was going to come in the most unexpected of ways in a little town of Bethlehem where a king would be born in a, whole, a lowly way. As I said last week, the devil's lies are meant to make you proud. The truth of Scripture and the truth of God is always meant to humble you. That way God can exalt you. And so Jesus came in a very humble form, very humbly. And in his humility, he waged war on the cross. He identified with the lowly, the meek, the persecuted. And because of that, there is great hope. Because just as Jesus was placed in the ground, he was risen and he was exalted. 
Today, we're going to look at a different dimension of this war. We're going to explore the unseen realm of the war. We're going to look at the spiritual realm of this war between the serpent and the woman. And we're going to see the devil's downfall and what that means for us in the church and the great hope that that gives us between that war that happened not just uh, carried out on this earth but in the heavens. So let's look together at Revelation chapter 12. I'm going to read it and then we'll pray. So this is the word of God. It's eternally true and applicable for all of life. A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and on her head a crown of 12 stars. And she was with child and she cried out, being in labor and in pain to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven and behold a great red dragon having seven heads and 10 horns and on his head were seven diadems, and his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. And she gave birth to a son, a male child, who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God so that there she would be nourished for 1,260 days. And there was war in heaven, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon, the dragon and his angels waged war, and they were not strong enough. And there was no longer a place found for them in heaven, and the great dragon was thrown down, and the serpent of old who is called The devil and Satan who deceives the whole world, he was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. Then then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down. He who accuses them before our God day and night. And they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony. And they did not love their life even when faced with death. For this reason rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the earth and the sea because the devil has come down to you having great wrath, knowing that he has only a short time. And when the devil saw that he was thrown down to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the two wings of the great eagle were given to the woman so that she could fly into the wilderness to her place where she was nourished for a time and times and a half a time from the presence of the serpent. And the serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman so that he might cause her to swept away with the flood. But the earth helped the woman and the earth opened its mouth and drank up the river which the dragon poured out of his mouth. So the dragon was enraged with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her children who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray that God would bless the preaching of his word. Heavenly Father, we we know you are good and you keep your promises. You clothe your church in the righteousness of Jesus. You protect her from her enemy And because of Jesus Christ, that slanderer, that accuser of the brethren has been cast out of heaven. He makes war on the church, but you preserve her. Help us, Lord, to continue to fight, to overcome by the blood of the Lamb, the testimony of the Word, and our love of you more than even our own lives. Help us to fight and know that we are fighting from victory to victory in Christ Jesus. And I pray now that you would give me words that would be clear to make this passage understandable and applicable to us, that it would strengthen your people for this battle. And I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. All right, so we find ourselves in the book of Revelation, and that's the one that gets people all excited about, right? Particularly new believers. It's like you get a new book and you flip to the end to see if it's worth reading. Everybody does that, and that's what everybody does. And as soon as they did, they're like, what in the world did I just get into? It gets a little overwhelming, and this has led to a a whole lot of uh, weird and 
misguided interpretations. In fact, they'd probably say the sheer number of interpretations of this book probably would be, if you put them all together, would be much larger than the Bible themselves and take many volumes. And because of that, that leads to many of us to be quick to want to disregard it or, well, I'll get to that at some point. And we kind of we kind of view it as shrouded in mystery, impenetrable. But that's actually a misinterpretation of what this book is. It's not called mystery or enigma. It's called revelation, which means unveiling. Well, it means it's not something meant to be hidden, but something to be understood, to be revealed. If you were to turn to chapter 1 and you look at the, ver- the opening verse, so if you want to do that, you can follow along with me for just a second. Verse 1 says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants the things which must soon take place, and he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bondservant John. Again, notice that it is called revelation, not a puzzle, not a mystery. And notice it was given to John to show to those called Christ's servants, meaning it's meant to be clear. You think about when God went and and met with Abraham, and he revealed to Abraham, "What, what, what should I tell Abraham what I'm about to do? And he told him in clear terms what he was about to do. This is that same book. This book is intended by God to be understood by his people, his servants, his friends, what he's about to do. And it actually is a one revelation of Jesus Christ and his victory over his adversaries and the great victory of the gospel. Now, that word show there in the, in the first verse lets you know that this is like, it's like a movie. It's a, it's a picture. There's symbolism. Uh, and that imagery is used to depict unseen spiritual realms, truths, and future events. And so while the symbolism can complicate interpretation, it, it shouldn't make the book unattainable because actually what ends up happening is the book tells you when it's a sign And the book tells you often what the sign is. Sadly, many people will read that and see where it says this is the sign, and the sign means this, and then they will just ignore that part and come up with all kinds of strange and crazy things. But you don't have to overlook the book's own explanation, so don't fall into that trap. One more thing about the key understanding. This is found in Revelation 1-2, and this is all to help us understand our passage It says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants the things which must soon take place, and he sent and communicated by his angel to his bondservant John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. In other words, this book, everything in it is a testimony to the word of God and the words of Jesus Christ, in particular in the gospel. And so all the imagery and the images are not just random. They all come from the scriptures. Some people have said that this is the most Old Testament book of the New Testament. The most Old Testament book of the New Testament. If you're going to understand Revelation, you've got to understand the Old Testament. You also need to understand the Gospels, in particular Jesus' parables, and what is called the Olivet Discourse, which is Matthew chapter 24. That's when Jesus went up on the mountain of Olives, overlooking Jerusalem, the temple, and he foretold the destruction of Jerusalem. You'll see there in uh, that first verse again that this was something that Jesus uh, had given to John through an angel to tell his servants of that much soon take place. That means this book actually had uh, uh, relevancy to the people in their own time when this book was written. Many people make it all about all future events and uh, like about airplanes and all those things. That's not the book, okay? It's, it has nothing to do with airplanes in so, in so far, unless God uses them. But like, that, uh, uh, rather, this book is, I believe, John's version of the Olivet Discourse. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we call those the synoptic gospels. They all have that, that, that sermon where Jesus talks about the destruction of Jerusalem and his second coming. John does not have it in his Gospels. Reason why? He's got a whole book about it. 
And that's what this is. And then one last key aspect here is found in verse 3 of chapter 1. It says this, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heeds the things which are written in it. This tells you the purpose of the book is not to terrify you, not to fulfill your curiosity about things in the future or even spiritual things just for us to debate and all those things. Rather, its purpose was to be a blessing to God's people who read it, listen to it, and obey it. That read it, listen to, and obey it actually is referring to the reader of reading it in the church service. So you got to think of that time, it would have been read out loud, they were supposed to hear it, and they were supposed to obey it, which means that it was meant to be a blessing to them, to encourage them through persecution that Jesus Christ reigns, that he is victorious, and that he will destroy their enemies. Too many people look at the book of Revelation and they focus only on the enemies, and, and it makes them be worried, and they... And that's what their whole, they think of about. It's like some kind of trying to find out this like monster energy drink is the sign of the beast and stuff. You're looking for all kinds of weird stuff. That's not what the book is about. It's about strengthening us in our battles using imagery from the Old and New Testament and truths of what God is about to do to the city of Jerusalem at that time and in the future when he returns to defeat all the enemies in the end. And so uh, with that in mind, let's look at chapter 12, and I want you to see then here that this is not something that ought to uh, frighten us or confuse us, but actually there's great hope in here. And before we do, let me just make a quick aside. Uh, I want to recommend to you, if you want more about how to interpret the book of Revelation, there's a guy named Dr. Philip Kaiser, he has a website called Biblical Blueprints, and on there he has, I think there are 13 to 15 sermons just on chapter 1, walking through all the keys to interpreting the book of Revelation. Go on there, it's all written out, so you don't even have to listen to it, you can just read it all, and it's very helpful. I'm very indebted to him in this sermon. But, so let's go back to chapter 12, those are kind of the preliminary things that get into it, Okay. So chapter 12 begins, it says, a great sign appeared in the heavens. So we know John in this book, in, in the spirit, has been called into the heavens to witness the throne room of God. He sees the worship there, and he sees God's response to the persecution of his people through the judgment of those persecutors, and now he's in heaven and he's getting a glimpse of something am amazing. He's getting a glimpse, this image, this picture of the conflict, as we've been talking about the last three weeks, of the woman and the serpent, between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. And so this first sign says that uh, we're seeing a woman, and she's clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head, and she's in the throes of childbirth. She's pregnant. So who is this? Well, there's a clue provided in verse 5. She gives birth to a son destined to rule the nations with an iron scepter who's then taken up to heaven and God's throne. So we, we can answer the easy question, who's that? Jesus. That's obvious. After the child's birth, she flees to a place prepared by God for his safety, for her safety, actually, not only after her, his birth, but also after his ascension, okay? So that's what here. So if you think about Isaiah chapter 7, 14, it says a sign will be given to you, a virgin will be with child. Well, I saw somebody, when I asked who this woman is, tell us what the Roman Catholics think. The Roman Catholics think that this is Virgin Mary, okay? And they will argue from that that this is, that she is the queen of heaven. And this is why they lift her up and exalt her, Okay? And there, she is the one who gave birth to Jesus. And she did flee after his birth to Egypt. But that interpretation is not what fits with Scripture here. For one, the wilderness fleeing is after Jesus' sins. And it's for a longer period than Mary would have fled to Egypt. 
Furthermore, if you look down at verse 17, it describes the dragging, waging war against her other offspring. And if you know the Roman Catholics, and, and this is not necessarily just a bash on them, but they believe in the Mary's perpetual virginity, which means she would have had no other children, which they, I don't know how they, 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 have to, they have to mess around with their stuff to get to where they're at. You ought to know the Protestant reformers did not necessarily disagree with them on Mary being a virgin, but whether Mary had other children or not is the, not the point of this, because who are her other children here? They are those who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And so we can acknowledge that Mary is Jesus' mother, but this passage is a sign in the heavens. It's a, sign, it's a spiritual thing in the heavens. So it's not speaking of Mary. Jesus provides the insights in his gospels to help us with this. In Matthew 12, he's preaching and his mother and his brothers come up to him. And they're needing to talk to him and it's too hard to get in there. And somebody comes and says, hey Jesus, your mother and your brothers are outside. And he says, who is my mother and my, my brothers? Well, they're outside, Jesus. And then what does he do? He points at his disciples and says, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. On another occasion, Jesus was walking through a crowd and someone yelled out to him, blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast which nurtured you. That was probably the first Roman Catholic, the first praying the rosary. And that would have been, if that's what we're supposed to do, the perfect time for Jesus to say, amen, right? What does he actually say? On the contrary, like he contradicts them. That's a pretty strong, in the English that doesn't sound quite as strong, but in the gr Greek there it is very strong. On the contrary, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Now it's not that Jesus dishonors Mary. I mean, he honored her greatly for him to be he chose her to be his mother. But what he wants everyone to know is that it's the church that is blessed. And so this indicates to us that this woman symbolizes not Mary specifically, though she would be part of this, but something greater. That is, the collective people of God portrayed in the Old Testament as Zion and the New Testament as New Jerusalem, or other words, the church of God, the bride of Christ. Now, let me give you a little bit more evidence for that. So if you were to look through the Old Testament, you will see that God describes his people as, women, as a woman in labor, anticipating the birth of the Messiah. So if you were to look at Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Hosea, and Micah, they all use this imagery. For example, Isaiah chapter 26, 17, 18 says, As a pre pregnant woman approaches the time to give birth, she rise and cries out in labor pains. And then listen to this part. Thus we were before you, O Lord. We were pregnant. We writhed in labor. We gave birth. Listen to that word, we. You know, look several different passages. I don't want to, I don't have time today to just belabor this point. But Micah 5, which we looked at last week, talked about Bethlehem. Then it talked about a woman to give birth. And what I didn't tell you last week is that all the commentators said that's not talking about Mary, that's talking about the church, the Old Testament people of God as they, like a woman in labor, are anticipating the coming of the Messiah. And that Jesus actually comes forth from God's people. He's one of us. And praise God, right? Paul in Galatians chapter 4 continues this. He calls Jerusalem above what? Our mother. The church, our mother. So you, you may have heard that phrase, you can't have God as father if you don't have your church, the church as mother. And people were like, where does it say that? Well, this is it, okay? This is it. Psalm chapter 87 is another Old Testament book that talks about Zion or Jerusalem, which is symbolic of the church, and says that God counts those who are born in her. And so these scriptures collectively illustrate that the woman in Revelation 12 is God's people, the church. 
It's in their collective anticipation and fulfillment of God's promise through Christ. It's the church that is the queen of heaven, not Mary. She is a part of that, but not her specifically. And it is the church the serpent tries to destroy and that Christ will always protect. And I, I had something in here, but I'm going to skip it. But just so you know, what I just told you was also the most well-accepted view throughout church history. So I didn't make it up. Now, I want you to see something about this woman, the church, other than her pregnancy. That is, she is clothed with the sun. Philip Kaiser explains that she reflects the glory of her husband. Now, how do we get that? Okay, let's talk about how we get there. Well, so we have three images here. We have the, the sun, the moon, and the stars. I asked my children this, and, and one of them got it. Where else in Scripture do you see those three things describing something? Anybody know? Huh? Somebody, Zach. Joseph, that's right. Yes, there we go, with Joseph. Joseph's dream. And remember what the son was? It was the father, the husband. And the son represents the father, the husband. So here's the question. Who's the husband of the woman, the spiritual Jerusalem? It's the Lord God and Jesus Christ. He is the son. All right, in the Old Testament, it is Jehovah. Jehovah is called the son. In the New Testament, it is Jesus. Well, Jesus is Jehovah because he's the pre-existent son of God. And so Revelation chapter 1 says Jesus has the countenance like the sun shining in its strength. And Revelation 21 says that there will be no need of the sun in the heaven because Jesus is the light. He is the sun. And so this woman is clothed and radiates the sun. She's clothed, in other words, the glory and righteousness of Jesus. She's clothed in the glory and the righteousness of Jesus. Hallelujah for that. She also stands on the moon, which most commentators would take to mean that she's standing on the promises of the old covenant. The old covenant, uh, the old promises of the ceremonies and the signs and all those things in the Old Testament, they were all often revolving around the moon, the moon cycle, the lunar cycle. And so the moon often in scripture is spoken of the old covenant. And that is this woman, the church, reflects the glory of her husband, Jesus. She's clothed in his righteousness, and she stands on the promises of God given throughout the whole Old Testament. And then she wears a crown of 12 stars. We know what 12 is, the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 apostles. This is the church in all of her glory. And before we look at the, 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 the battle that occurs here, I just wanted to stop and let you think about this church. And I want you to consider how Scripture describes her here and compare it as if, th does this how you see the church? All right, she is glorious, shining with Christ's glory with his righteousness. And I know that's hard for us to see in, in our day to think that the church is glorious, but it's true. This is the picture given to us, and it's the reality, not just a picture, it is reality in the heavenly realms. The church is glorious because of the righteousness of Jesus, which means the church is righteous. That's how the church appears to God, clothed in Jesus Christ, clothed in the Son. She's been justified, declared righteous, made righteous. And because of that, she is secure, which is what you see all the way throughout this passage. Every time the dragon tries to attack, God either takes her into the wilderness and protects her there, or he even causes the earth to open up and stop the attack of the devil. There is nothing that can harm God's church. Again, she may need to go to the wilderness for a while. God may have to take us to the woodshed, right? Right? but he will protect us from the attacks of the devil. And God always shields her because she is his bride. She's righteous, clothed in the righteousness of Jesus. And so those who are part of this church, the heavenly church, then are genuinely righteous because of Jesus, and they are secure. Amen. And so knowing this, if, if the church is secure and God's bride is secure, what do you think about it? 
How, often, how do you perceive the glory of the church? Often we, we witness the church's imperfections, her mistakes. And on this earth there are people within her pale that are not believers, right? People within her ranks are not true believers. Individuals outwardly connected to the church that have no real part of it. And they will be removed when Christ comes and the angel separates the wheat from the chaff. However, this doesn't diminish the fact the church is glorious and the true church is righteous. Which means, brothers and sisters, you need to take joy in the church. And instead of being bitter or thinking you're better than the church when you observe its flaws, you should desire to be a part of her. You should have a high regard for her. It's Christ's bride. And Jesus says that she's glorious. And we should too. Now, the church in our day seems to be beaten up pretty bad, right? She's in need of a spiritual waking, and God often raises prophetic voices, right? So we, when I'm talking about seeing her in glorious, I'm not saying we, we dismiss things that need to be reformed or not have a prophetic voice. But you need to know the difference between constructive prophetic critique driven by love and disparaging self-righteous criticism cloaked as prophetic voice. So if men bounce from church to church, they rail at every minor issue, they have no honor for God's officers or compassion on the weak in the church, they are not prophets, they are wolves to be chased away. Jesus cherishes his church. So should we, accepting her as she stands in Christ. Often we craft this idolized version of the church, loving the illusion while scorning her actual state. Consider marriage, right? It's easy for a couple on their way to getting married. Everything's like starry-eyed and it's just going to be, you're going to have the perfect, everything's just going to be real perfect. And maybe it is for like a week or two, right? Still, are you still perfect? still perfect for them okay it's only been two weeks so but then after you get married you start seeing the flaws the sinfulness of the other person and that right there is when the work of love begins and actually oftentimes it's not even sins and flaws it's differences in preferences or differences in goals about the future and those can actually be harder to deal with than sins and, and flaws right but it's where the preferences and the goals start. That's where the hard work of a husband leading and a wife submitting and them all working together takes place. And the same thing in the church. Some people, you'll get on the website of a local church and you'll think, man, this is glorious about the website. Maybe you'll come visit for a few weeks and everything is so much better than all the other churches. And then you quickly find out, wait a second, there are some differences in preferences and differences in even goals, or even we may have differences in theologies and things. This is where the hard work of you still seeing the church as she is really takes place. It's when you do the work of Scripture that says, let the love cover a multitude of sins. It's where Christian charity, Christian truth speaking takes place. Love the church. And furthermore, remember, if you are in Christ, you too are robed in righteousness. Standing firm on God's promises, and you are destined to reign with Him in righteousness. Your shortcomings, now when you contrast them against God's magnificence, that ought to humble you, right? God's truths are to humble us. And yet you need to remember that God protects His people through all trials and tribulations, and He will continue to protect you. That's the work of faith that you need to have faith for, to believe God and His promises, to rest in his righteousness alone. And when you, get, when you sin and you fail, to keep going back to his righteousness. Because it is the ugly work of the devil to accuse you. But as we're about to see, he doesn't have any right to that anymore. And so it takes faith to, to reject the wicked accusations of the dragon and to believe the promises of God. So let's look at the dragon here. So the dragon, where is he at in this picture? He's in heaven. 
Which is an uh, interesting question. Why would the dragon be in heaven? Well, prior to the fall, God created all things and made them all good, including dragons. All right? So the dragons are real. All right? We know in Scripture of at least three of them, one called Tannin in Psalm 91, Leviathan in Psalm 104, and Rahab in Job 26. Perhaps these were dinosaurs or, or maybe the dragons that are in all the legends that you see worldwide. But whatever the case, the dragon was, inherent, was from the beginning good. You see that in Ezekiel 28, 13 to 14, which portrays the devil prior to his fall as a paragon of perfection, wisdom, and beauty. The scripture says, you were perfect in your ways from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. Now, some will say, well, that's about earthly kings in those passages, but actually it goes behind earthly kings, kings, starts talking about them, and then it talks about the true forces behind them, the, and Satan being the leader of all them. And that reminds us even like with Herod, Herod here trying to kill Jesus, Satan was the one behind that. He's the puppeteer behind the scenes. But the point is the dragon wants a powerful being created by God, and our text describes him as great. Some of them say huge, a huge red dragon. By his greatness, he, that's probably what made him proud. Isaiah 14 vividly depicts his fall from grace, driven by a desire to rival the Most High. And then you have the thing about his, even he's so great that his tail can knock a third of the stars out of the heaven. And I would argue this is symbolizing Satan's seduction of the third of the angelic host in rebellion, which is pretty bone-chilling to think about. Like a third of all of God's creation in heaven rebelled. And the devil was so mighty that he was able to convince a third of the angels and heavenly beings to rebel against God. And that ought to make you shudder a little bit, yet don't forget this. It was only a third, which means two-thirds actually are ours. So there's still two-thirds that fight on the side of righteousness, which we, we outnumber the devil. So the point I want to make is don't trivialize your adversary. Remember Martin Luther's words in a mighty fortress. And one time I made this mistake. I used to lead worship at a church. And I got up, and I don't, sometimes we would only sing the first verse of songs. So we got up and we sang the first verse of a mighty fortress. And then afterwards I was like, did we just sing a praise song to the devil? <laughs> Because it kind of ends, you got to sing that whole one. But this is what it says in that first verse. His craft and power are great, and armed with cruel hate on earth is not as equal. You know, it's not kosher this day to speak about the devil. Our adversary has skillfully led American Christians to neglect the significance of spiritual warfare. So much of our own thoughts are on our own lives and on this world. We neglect the weapons given to us to fight a great enemy because he's convinced us he doesn't even exist. And we act like he doesn't exist. And this is why we often fall to the enemy. Or as Martin Luther said, did we in our own strength confide, our striving would be losing. We often rely on our own might, failing to realize that we are battling a formidable dragon. We are on a path where there is a ferocious lion. And we confront an adversary who deceived a third of the heavenly beings. Do we think that we, in our own power, can escape his deceptive power? Never forget this, brethren. You are at war. And it's not just against flesh and blood. It's not against Joe Biden. It's bigger. There's somebody behind him that's even worse. But also remember this that greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. With faith in Jesus, we have the champion we need on our side. The dragon may seethe with fury, yet he cannot triumph. And even if he were to subjugate all the angels, God can create more. Because that's the one thing the devil doesn't do. He can't create. All he can do is steal. He steals from God's kingdom. He lacks the ability to create angels. And then when that doesn't happen and he gets thrown down, from heaven, and that failed, he subsequently tries to steal the dominion of Adam. But through Christ, God swore, has thwarted that scheme as well. So, be wise, be alert, 
we have an enemy, but don't be fearful of him. Be fearful of God. Furthermore, don't emulate the devil by trying to strive, start your own kingdom. Don't become a brother with him in theft. Don't give him glory. Trust Christ, and with Christ you have the victory. And that's what we observe here with the woman and the dragon. Verse 4 states, the dragon was positioned before the woman. All right, the term stood there, you see that. Uh, it says she stood. That's in perfect tense, signifying something that happened in the past that was ongoing. And that is, this is telling you about the conflict that originated in Eden. And he was perpetually lying in wait to unleash his fury on the church. Right? He, and he does so by specifically targeting women and children of the church. It was because he's a coward as well as a thief and a murderer and a liar. He always comes after the weak. And that's because he knows the promise is to the seed of the woman, which is why he always goes after the women. And thus from the outset he waged war. And we see it all through the Old Testament. You remember Cain and Abel? Cain was most likely incited by Satan. As John 1 indicates, Satan was a murderer from the beginning. But despite Satan's plots, God's promise persevered. There was Seth that was born to Adam and Eve. And then the dragon sought to corrupt the lineage by having his wicked angels marry the daughters of men. And when God eliminated them in the flood and rescued Noah, the devil targeted Noah's descendants. And then the promise passed from Shem to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, and David. And the devil constantly assailed the church. And yet God protected her because the devil couldn't stop the woman from giving birth. And so she bore a son. And though the dragon stood ready, his rage was in vain because it says the son is destined to reign over the nations with an iron rod. We're talking about Jesus. He's the king of kings. The one who came to fill Adam's original calling to dominate the earth. And now the nations who were seemingly under the sway of the dragon are in fact going to be ruled by his son. And then it says this son was taken up to God in his throne. So hallelujah. The son was born. The dragon could not stop him. He, indeed, when he waged war, God protected him, and Christ ascended to heaven and throned at God's right hand. Now, when did that occur? After his resurrection. And what happened when Jesus ascended into heaven after his resurrection on a cloud? Where was he going? On a trip into the stars? Well, look over at Daniel chapter 7, because I want you to see something here. This is... This is, this is beautiful. Daniel chapter 7 says, uh, uh, um, is it verse 14? Somebody throw the number out when I start to read this. Daniel 7, 14, I think, says, I kept looking until the thrones were set up. Is that verse 14? 13, sorry, okay. I kept looking until the thrones were set up and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His vesture was white as snow and the head of his hair like a pure wool. His throne was ablaze with flames, its will a burning fire. A river of fire was flowing and coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands were uh, were attending him, and myriad upon myriad were standing before him. The court set and the books were open. This portrays the celestial courtroom. Right, you have God on his throne, the ancient of days, the heavenly host surrounded, and then it says this, Daniel observes this, he says, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold with the clouds of heaven, one like the Son of Man was coming. Son of Man, what's that mean? Well, what is Jesus' favorite title for himself? Son of Man. And this is precisely why, because Jesus, both God and man, he shares our nature He's like us. And here he is ascending on the crowds. And what's he doing when he ascends to the clouds? Well, the passage go on and says, He came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. Thus, Jesus approached God, and then notice what God does when Jesus ascends to the heavens. It says this, Dominion, glory, and kingdom were given to him. This means Jesus was given all authority, And God endowed him with glory, 
which is momentous because the scripture says God does not give his glory to another. And God is giving Jesus his glory and a kingdom. And for what purpose? What's the purpose? Why did Jesus to ascend? Now, you've always wondered why did Jesus ascend into heaven? Well, one of them is sent as the Holy Spirit. Another this. So that peoples, nations, and individuals of every tongue might serve him. His dominion is everlasting, unending, his kingdom indestructible. Wow, like Jesus holds all authority so that all peoples, nations, and every language group might serve him. And that empowers our work. There's a great commission to make disciples of the nations because Jesus has the required authority to accomplish it. He possesses the glory to merit it, and he rules over a kingdom capable of accomplishing it. So the Great Commission is something that can be carried out. And the dragon could not thwart God's promises to the church. She birthed the humble and lowly child whom God exalts to the throne, and Jesus ascended to heaven. And because Christ ascended into heaven and sits on the throne, there's something that's about to happen in the heavens. So as when Jesus goes into the heavens, we get a picture of what happens at that here in Revelation 12. And so the narrative changes from signs to events in heavens. And there's a state of upheaval that ensues and a certain someone's about to be kicked out. And now this is not describing the devil's initial fall. That was with the tell. This, he's already wicked. He's already in the heavens. Now why is he in the heavens? What's he doing there? Why, why does God even allow the devil in the heavens? He's an accuser. Go look at the book of Job. Job chapter 1, there's this gathering and the devil comes up and he accuses Job. He accuses Job. That's his work. He tempts us to sin and when we sin, he turns around and says, look what you've done. Look what you have done. But that's all about the change with Christ's ascension to the throne. So there's this Old Testament narrative I thought that was really helpful to think about this. Do you remember when King David was reigning and his son Absalom tried to rebel and kick David out of Jerusalem? Does anybody remember that story? And do you remember when David went out and he had to flee Jerusalem? There was this man named Shimei. And Shimei threw rocks at David and mocked David and cursed David when David was on the way down. And David's commander was like, you want me to go chop his head off? And he's like, no, God's already judged us. We're on the way down. Let's be humble about it. Well, when Absalom dies and David comes back, Shimei's like, he's shaken, and David says, don't worry about it. We've had this great victory here. No more bloodshed now. Like, he's being magnificent to it. But what happens to Shimei when... David passes the throne to Solomon when there's a new king. David says, you take him out. You don't want, there's a new king, you don't want any disloyalty here. He rids his court of his enemies. When there's a new king that comes to power, he rids his courts of enemies. That's what's happening here. Jesus is going into the heavens where this accuser stands, and he's going to purify it of all of its adversaries. Satan, once brazen in his accusations, finds his standing nullified by Christ's victory, and his right to remain in heaven is revoked. And there's this great heavenly war. Michael, the archangel, the leader of God's angelic forces, engages in a battle against the dragon. And notice this. Until now, Satan has been the aggressor. But if you read this part, the tables have been turned. It's not the devil that goes to war first. It's the angels and Michael that go to war. And the dragon now is on the defensive. And then the dragon, the ancient serpent, the devil, which means slanderer, by the way, the deceiver is cast out of heaven. The great spiritual battle and the devil has lost. His head has been stamped on. As Jesus has ascended into heaven, the devil has been kicked out. And this is amazing. Do you remember how the book of Genesis 3 ended? I told you it was some of the saddest words in all of Scripture. It ended with this words. 
So God drove the man out at the east of the garden. He stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword, which turned every direction the guard to the way the tree of life. Those are the saddest words. God drove man out of his presence. And he put angels to keep them from coming back. But now, brothers and sisters, this is the part that gives me goosebumps, okay? With the ascension of Christ, who is fully God and what? Fully man. Man, in Christ's humanity, regains access to God's throne room. It reverses Genesis 3. Man is allowed in, and now the dragon is drove out of the garden. And it's the angels with the flaming swords there that do it. Man is allowed into the presence of God. Our accuser, no more. And listen to this resounding proclamation from heaven. Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down. He who accuses them before our God day and night. There is victory And then take note of this crucial detail. They overcame him because of the blood of the lamb and because of the word of the testimony, and they did not love their life even when faced with death. There's something interesting going on here. Uh, Tom Wright, in his commentary, says, there's a puzzle in this passage because the decisive victory has won, but it seems that two different groups of people have been involved in winning it. There's a war in heaven... An alarming enough concept, he says. Michael, the great archangel of Daniel 10, summons all his angels to fight against the dragon and his angels. But wait a minute, he says. The song of victory which follows this great event gives credit for the victory not to Michael, but to God's people on earth. They conquered him, says the loud voice from heaven, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, because they did not love their lives unto death. So who defeated the dragon? Was it Michael or was it the martyrs? Yes, thank you. It was both. He says the heavenly reality of the victorious battle is unbiblically, I don't even know how to say that word. It's like a, uh, um, the unbiblical chord, what do you call that? Is that right? Not unbiblical, but um, the, that chord, that's the word he uses. Joined to the earthly reality. That is, there's this thing connecting what happens in heaven to what happens on earth. You remember what Jesus said, what you do on earth will happen in heaven, what happens on earth, all right? What connects these two realms? What connects the unseen and the seen? It's this phrase, the salvation, power, and kingdom of our God and the authority of Christ, right? It's also these words, the blood of the Lamb. And the power of their testimony, right? And so the triumph of the heavenly angels as they expel the devil and the triumph of the saints, which is us, brothers and sisters, over the relentless accusations of the devil and over the dragon are solely attributed to Christ. It's through Christ's salvation, Christ's power, Christ's kingdom, Christ's authority, Christ's blood that these victories are secure. Right, the angels could not have done it without Christ, and neither can we. Again, look at how the believers on earth overcame. By the blood of the Lamb, by proclaiming Christ's word, and by loving Christ more than their own life. In essence, our triumph in the battle stems from Christ's divine agency by working through us. Now, we're out of time, and I, I wish I had more time to go through the rest of the passage, but because the devil still makes war to us, but let's conclude with this truth. At the appointed hour, precisely when everything appeared bleak, Christ was born, and our devil, our adversary, could not hinder it. And through Christ's unwavering obedience and sacrificial death on the cross, Christ secured our redemption, atoning for the punishment we rightly deserved, liberating us from the devil's relentless accusation. And Jesus ascended to heaven where he reigns supreme. And the devil no longer possesses any claim or authority over the children of God. He has been cast out. 
Other scripture tells us that he has been bound so that he cannot prevent the gospel from going forth. Certainly, he still prowls around. I, I, I don't, don't belittle the fact that we have battles to face. But the battle we face is one we can face with unwavering faith because it is a battle in which we advance from one victory to the next. In other words, we are an army marching from victory to victory. We've won. We will win. We win. We win down here. We win up there. We win. Now this is war and undoubtedly there will be suffering. Yet when we rely on the blood of the Lamb, you cannot be defeated. You've been granted forgiveness of your sins. The dragon can no longer hurl his accusations against you before heaven's thrones. And brothers and sisters, that is cause for rejoicing, not only on Sunday or Christmas, every day. Because you, you know, you're well acquainted with your transgressions, right? You know that you deserve the wrath of God, that you, you deserve it. And you know that the devil's accusations against you are maybe the only thing that has any kernel of truth that he's ever said. But his accusations do not stand against you in the heavens. In fact, they're only limited now to your own conscience. And even then, when he accuses you, he doesn't reveal the whole truth, right? When you sin and the devil accuses you, he fails to remind you that you are in Christ. And you are clothed in the righteousness of Jesus. You're clothed in the Son. He fails to tell you about the promises that you stand on. Or the great hope that you will reign with Jesus Christ forever. He doesn't tell you the complete picture. He's a liar. Thus, do not listen to the lies of the devil. Don't, listen, don't lend an ear to his lies. The falsehoods peddled by his demons or representatives embrace the truth which is this, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you your sins. Brothers, that image of that radiant woman clothed in the sun, that is you represented there in Christ Jesus. And so when you stumble in your sins, don't wallow in the mire. Get up. Go to your father. The devil, your accuser, has been kicked out of the throne room, but you have access to that throne room now. You get to boldly go to the throne room of God. In fact, you're there. Ephesians 2 says it. You are seated in the heavenlies with Christ. That's your rightful place. In Christ, you are adorned with a crown. You're granted a throne. And on the day of his return, everybody will see that. Lastly, brothers and sisters, reflecting on the connection between the victory in heaven and the triumph of the saints... Take a lesson from the heavenly angels, and let's go on the offensive. The church of Jesus Christ should not remain on the defensive alone. We should, just like the angels pursued the devil, we should actively pursue everything that Satan thinks he owns, pray fervently over those domains, and subject them all to the authority of Christ. We should not be content until the demonic realm is expelled from earth just as it was once cast out of heaven. And so rather than perpetually reacting to the schemes of Satan, let us seize the initiative, declare war against him. Let's go on the offensive, brothers and sisters. The gates of hell can't prevail against the church. So pray. Have faith. Love God more than this life. When I talk about offensive and I'm talking about victory here, I'm not necessarily saying it won't, it's going to look like the world's victory. It may look like you dying or you being persecuted, losing your job. But it's through that the victory comes, Scripture says. And it's because of that you are more than a conqueror. You're more than a conqueror. You're not less than that. More than that in Christ. And so, brothers and sisters, the seed of the woman has crushed the head of the seed of the serpent. And the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet too. Amen? Merry Christmas. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. The picture there of the battle, the devil has been cast out, and we know he still rages. He still makes war. Lord, we are victorious in the same way that they were the blood of the Lamb. Your word. 
and are willing to suffer for your kingdom. We are more than conquerors. Help us, Lord, then to do that work, casting out the devil everywhere he may be found, all of his little fiends everywhere he may be found. Let us do so by prayer, with the word of God and faithfulness to you. And Lord, we pray that you would have your name be hallowed in all the earth, that all the nations, all the peoples, all tongues would proclaim your goodness and bow their knees before you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.